a new purpose. And that purpose birthed Right to Dream Football Academy. Located 80 kilometers northeast of Accra in a small town called Old Akradi, this academy, which started with 16 children, has now expanded to three new countries in Denmark, Egypt, and the USA, producing some of the best talents, not just in football, but in industry and in academia as well. And after 25 years at the forefront building his own dream, he's stepping down as CEO of the Right to Dream group. My guest on this Joyce Pearl special is Tom Vernon, Executive Vice Chairman of the Right to Dream group, founder of the Right to Dream Academy, as well as chairman of FC Norchaland. He's a very special guest, and we've come all the way here to North Accredi to talk to him. Come on, let's go meet Tom. Tom, where you are? Hey. Ah. How's How it going? Are you, man? Good welcome to see back. you. Yeah, welcome back to Ghana. Oh, it's my How home. long have you been away? Oh, I, I go and come all the time, so yeah. I've been here 10 days this time. Uh, 10 days this time? That's a long time. Listen, yeah. uh, it's a beautiful thing you've built in here. I uh, Just doing the research for this interview alone, I found out some very interesting things about you. I didn't originally know that you came to Ghana to coach House of Folk as a 19-year-old. How does that happen? Which 19-year-old arrives from the UK to come and coach one of the greatest clubs in Ghana? Africa. In Africa, thank you. Because you're a Kotoko <laughs> fan, you're trying to <laughs> downplay us that. a little bit. That's but, fine, that's fine. You know, and especially, I like Kotoko, but it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> especially at that time, you know, it was, a, it was really on top. Um, and uh, in the UK, I wasn't a very good player. So in the UK, it was really difficult to break in. I'd done all my coaching badges and I wanted to work in the game. And so I just had an idea, okay, maybe if I go abroad, you know, it's not a new idea, for, especially for European coaches to go abroad and, and develop their skills. And so I had an idea and then I got a connection actually directly to Harry Zakor. He said, no problem, come down and, 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 and observe. So I was there for six weeks and then um, it didn't work out. Actually, I went to Olympics. As um, well. Yeah, so that's this while you so, were 19. Uh, starting at that age, yeah. So I think Olympics was maybe by 21 or something. Okay. Um, and then I did a little bit there. And then actually with Herbert Addo, I went back to Haas for a little while as well. So doing a lot of, uh, I got a lot of mentors from that. Uh, one of my early mentors was uh, Sir Cecil Jones at okay. Quifio. He, he liked me and he used to invite me around to the house. Herbert Addo was another uh, really important mentor for me. Another former player of House of Oak, Robert Tetti. So I was lucky that yeah. um, I was in the ecosystem here and um, yes. rather than coming with an idea from abroad of like, okay, this is how we do things, I got somehow connected to the, the big names in, in Ghana football and they helped shape my ideas. And so I, I liked coaching, but I, had, I got the idea for the academy and you know, so went on another track and then the coaching was full time. And so it was difficult to do both. And then I got a job with, with Sir Alex Ferguson at Man United. And that wasn't actually a full-time uh, full gig. So it meant that I could work one week a month. I had to go to one country in Africa every month, do a full analysis for Man United. And then three weeks I would be here. I had a salary, but I could then really focus on the academy. So that's a little bit of the early days. It is, it is. I mean, and that is very impressive because I'm wondering, for example, you come into to, to Ghana as a teenager, Heart of Folk doesn't work out, go to Olympic, doesn't quite work out as well, you come back to Heart of Folk. And during that same period, somehow you landed a job with Manchester United, one of the greatest football clubs in the world. At that time. At that time. It still is. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm wondering, and, and all of this while you were still trying to find your feet in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So how did that happen? Um, it was a random set of circumstances. I, I, um, I decided to attend like all the uh, um, tournaments in, in Africa just to get my um, sort of bearings and understand yes. the, the industry. So I went to an under-17 African Championships in Gambia. Okay. And I met the Man United. 2005? No, maybe earlier. Under maybe 17? Early, was, was it the one Ghana lost to Gambia? Yeah, the yeah. The final two or five, yeah. Okay. David Duncan was the coach yeah, yeah. of the Ghana team. Um, and I met the Man United scout there. Okay. 
and he lived in Cape Town and he liked a player from Burkina Faso. Oh. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm not going to do anything because uh, I don't want to go to Burkina Faso. I said, I'll go for you. That's right. So I went to Burkina Faso and tracked down the family and, and uh, found the player, told him that I was working on behalf of the Man United scout. And so I arranged everything and then I called. Uh, in those days, I didn't even have a mobile phone. I called the landline in Cape Town. Yeah. The wife answered and she said, oh, he passed. And um, so after the funeral, I called the switchboard at Man United. I said, look, I was working on a player for Frank. Um, that was the scout. Right. And, um, and he's passed, so do you want me to do anything? They said, yeah, we had the reports. Um, and then I, I embellished a little bit. So I said, oh, there was also a guy in, there was also a guy in Ghana. <laughs> He was looking at it. They said, oh, we didn't know anything about that guy. I said, yeah, yeah. There's... yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so then I mentioned one guy from yeah, Mike, and I said, okay, he can come as well. So I brought the two guys up, and, um, and actually they wanted to sign the guy from Burkina Faso. Okay. He decided not to sign, oh, wow. uh, which was a heartbreak for me. Oh, wow. But still, when I was there, they did a lot of assessments. They asked me to watch a lot of games, predict which players were going to make it and everything. And then at the end, Sir Alex sat me down. He said, okay. Frank has passed, I want you to be the new guy in, in Africa, which for me as a young guy, you know, that's the beauty of football. Like, in, in everything else, you take your steps, you do your degrees, you pass through the process, but football, like, one day you can be here, you tell the boys, the next day you can be on the yeah. pitch with Ronaldo or Mbappe, and it will happen just like that. So for me, that was a little bit like my, my moment, and then from that, I got so much exposure to the Man United Academy. Sir Alex gave me a lot of ideas, and I used some of those ideas to you know, build right to dream. And he was great because he said, okay, every year um, you can bring two right to dream boys. Oh, wow. And so every year the best two got to go to Man United. And then I would obviously scout for whoever I thought the best player in Africa was as well. So that was like one of the early motivations for our boys was like the best two here are going to Man United. To Man United. Big deal. And we never got, we never managed to get a player there, but I'm sure it's going to happen in the in the Sooner future. rather than later. Maybe. So I'm quite sure. And if you had the bell there, it's because we're right in the middle of the, we call this academic compound, or what do you call it? Yeah, the, school. Yeah, yeah of, of right to dream. The students, or the, yeah, they're in class right now. Uh, you want to call them footballers. Tom actually refers to them as students. It's just basically what they are. Student athletes. Yeah, student athletes. There you go. Um, and we'll go to some other classrooms. But um, one last thing on that. Man United scouting job. There is a famous story about the John Mikel Obi episode. Um, how involved were you? Were you the one that recommended him to Man United? No, that was Frank. That was Frank. Um, but it was like going on as I was as I was starting. So yes. it was an interesting process, you know. And um, you know, I, I don't know if you remember with those early Afcons like 2006 as well. Yeah. Obi was a ten. And Sir Alex saw him, you know, he even referred to him like the next Sedan. And he was playing 10 and, and just looked like a, a different player to the one that we got to know, who was obviously still a great player, but he was more offensive and they were so excited about him. And then, you know, and then he changed his mind and went to Chelsea and the rest is, the rest is history, you know. But Suli was there, uh, Michael Essien was there. They so, both went for that trial. Yeah, yeah. So that was before. But so, you know, a lot of players got really close and just missed the, you know, and, and actually the Man United scout uh, in Denmark, he sadly also just passed, but his last big project was Caduce and he was pushing like crazy that he wanted Man United to sign Caduce directly from FCN, but they didn't that agree didn't to that one either. So. Uh, we'll get to the Caduce story, but um, I, I one of the, this is one of the most distinct things I see every time I come to Right to Dream. You've got a war here, a global war, and you've have, you have pictures, magnets, I believe, that you've stuck to different parts of the world, different countries, basically depicting where each of your graduates is. Is that what's happening on this wall? Yeah, so uh, the way we, the way we uh, run it here is that we run a whole trial process across Ghana, and you have a local trial, then you have a regional trial, and then you have a final trial where you're here and you mix into the environment for about a month to, so that we can see really whether you're a, a good fit. And then if you make it, then we have a scholarship ceremony up in the dining room yeah. and we present you with your picture. And then we make a guard of honor and the young student athlete walks down and then they put their map, they put their picture on the, on the map. Okay. And then when you graduate, 
you do a graduation speech, you walk down, you pick your picture off the map, and then you put it wherever you're going. Wow. And then once you're there, then we change the image according to an image of you performing wherever you go. So um, it's really part of like the culture, and then it's really nice because you can see the young kids when they're in, and they'll come and stand here for hours, and they're just looking up. Obviously, a lot of guys studying in the U.S. and playing in the U.S. and then yes. um, so this is uh, so this basically this is America. That's a lot of kids in in the U.S. Um, wow, probably even more than the ones in Europe. I think so. Yeah, that's crazy. So that's the that's the policy here, and you know, it was um, I was really lucky, like I said before, with some of my early mentors that. Early on, um, I don't know if you remember this, but when George Weir retired, he was involved a little bit with um, uh, Midland with uh, Alaji yeah. Bimbo was doing yeah. a project. Yeah. Yeah. So there was two, they were called Ajax pitches at the University of Legon, and we managed to get one, okay. and then George Weir was training on the other one. And, and then it was really nice, because just across the road in Aponglu, Abedi Pele was, yes. so it was like this mecca of Africa's greatest legends, and I was just a young coach trying to make it, and you couldn't believe it, like, wow. And even Tony Abbott was starting a project around there as well. So there was this like center of excellence in East Legon. And then George Weir got closest to me. And um, for some reason, he, he took a liking to me. And then he used to come and train at the old academy with the boys. Uh -huh. And then um, in those times in Ghana, we had uh, Ajax, Feyenoord with the big academies in Ghana. Yes. And then he asked me one day, Tom, what are you trying to achieve? I said, one day I want to have a academy like that he said oh then you're gonna fail and I said why and he said because they're not here for Ghana and that's the most pertinent thing anybody's ever said to me yeah. and I asked him what's the like what's the meaning he said you have to find something which is really here for Ghana and then whatever you're hoping to achieve can be a byproduct okay. but if you're here for yourself like Ajax were here for themselves yeah. he said he's gonna fail and you see it's prophetic because they they failed Absolutely. so our idea was like okay if we're here for Ghana what does it mean let's um, make sure that every kid, once you're in, you're guaranteed to be in for five years. Yeah. Because in the European model, if you have a bad season, you go home. In Europe, no problem, because you have a good life outside of your academy. But here, you know, for a kid to come into this environment and then think every year I might be asked to leave, that's a, is, is an untenable situation. And then, um, then we said, okay, what if a, a kid isn't going to make it as a footballer? We have to treat every kid as if it was our own son. So that's where we got this idea. We have an office in New York now, and we built all these pathways to say, okay, if you take your education seriously, you can end up in uh, in US on scholarship. And then the last thing was like, okay, if we're here for Ghana, then we can't do only boys. We have to do boys and girls. That's right. And everybody said, what's the business model behind girls? But ours was more of a cultural model inspired by Social George Weir. That, and so, of course, we have our problems like everybody, but. If you go into the communities, then the coaches know that, okay, all my boys that went to Right to Dream, yeah. either they're in US studying or they made it as a pro, and even they've been taking girls from the community as well. So we try as much as we can to make the best impact we can on the Ghana education and football ecosystem. Yeah. And then the byproduct of business and success of FCN should be a byproduct rather than the objective. And so that hopefully is our, like, our example, because a lot of people are trying to do academies in Africa now, is like, don't come in with the extractive mindset. Try to come in and be part of the ecosystem. And, and that's what we try to do. You know, um, you, you, the whole time just listening to you tell that story, it, it just says everything about it being the humble beginnings of this academy and how you started out. And I wanted to show you a picture uh, so we can start that conversation about the very beginning. When you look at this picture, for example, now this is a picture that is, what are we looking at here? This is a picture from the very beginning. Mm. And this, I presumably, it's where? Legon. This is the University of Ghana. I thought I recognized that. Do you remember any of these kids? How many of these kids do you yeah, remember? Yeah, of course. I, I remember most of them, yeah. And this is Robert Tete. He was, um, he was my very first mentor in Ghana. He played for House of Oak. And then he was um, a, a teacher at GIS, and that's how I got to know him. Oh, wow. And then he was the very first person to start showing me the fundamentals, introducing me to people. And he sadly passed, but um, yeah. he's, he's, he's like, this place is his legacy as much as mine. 
You famously started with 16 kids in your home mm. in Jowalu. Those 16 kids, quite a number of them have become successful mm. or went on to become successful. Some of them even play for the national team. Mm. Who are some of the, for a lot of people that are watching that know a lot of national team footballers, who are some of the graduates from the very first class of Right to Dream? Should be up here. Should so, be up um, here somewhere. Most of them are retired now though. Yeah, you know, because this uh, 25 years ago, and it is a long time they ago. started when they were 10, 11. So, uh, the guys who uh, we had Godfrey Saka, who played for the local Black Stars, King Godfrey Osei, Saka. yeah, yes, the German stars, yeah, yeah, yeah. King Osei Jam played for the Black Stars once, yeah, but had a good career in Europe. Daniel Owusu played for, mm, I can't remember if it was under 20 or, I think he may have played a friendly game. I can't remember, but he had a good career in Europe. And then there was like two or three other boys, Isaac Shays, uh, Samuel Lai Mensa. They had decent careers in Europe. And then a lot of the boys went and studied in America from that early group. I think six of them graduated from top universities in America as well. So, you know, the crazy thing is that the, the trial for uh, that early group was 100 boys. We picked 16. And then from that 16, you have five or six having full careers in Europe five or six getting degrees. So, you know, we're still only scratching the surface here because if from 100 you can produce those results, imagine if the kind of methodology that we have was really scaled. Ghana will have no size in, uh, in world football. Absolutely. And you know, one of, the, one, of the, one of the best things about this academy also has to be your scouting network because mm. I can't imagine how difficult it is to choose 16 kids from 100. And I don't know that it's even worse now in the sense that you have to choose very few from a much larger group. Mm. How do you arrive at those decisions? Because it must be very emotional even for the scouts to see every kid come out there, 1,000 kids come out there with every single one of them looking for a pathway mm. uh, to get into the right to dream. And you only have to choose a very limited number. And that limited number, you have to be sure that these are the very best and that you're not doing anybody any favors. Yeah. How do you negotiate that kind of system it's tough it's really tough and you know the the starting point is that or the first thing i'll say is that the kids who don't get in let's say we take the top 20 the kids from number 21 down to let's say number 100 yeah. would get into any academy in europe any academy in europe so you can take the guy number 100 we don't have space for him here if yeah. he lives in madrid he'll be in the real madrid academy wow. that's my view so it, it shows like how much is still to be done to serve the talent right. and the youth of Ghana. Like we, we need uh, much more of, 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 of right what we're doing. Dreams. So I wouldn't say right to dreams, but I say we need, because we're doing our part, but yeah. we need much more expansion of like talent development. You know, my view is Ghana's, by far Ghana's biggest asset is the talent of its children, yeah. not in football, but broadly. And secondly, um, the admissions criteria is do we think that this kid can play in the Champions League or study in the Ivy League in future? Those are the two important Those things. are the two. So down from that, you have um, all kinds of metrics, academic testing, all kinds of football data-related subjective analysis of every kid. And then you have the, the secret source, which is character. And so when the kids come and live here, we have some amazing pastoral staff here who can really analyze like, okay, which kids have the perspective, the hunger, um, the discipline, all the mental attributes that are required. Yeah. Um, because as we all know, like ultimately that's what defines success rather than your ability to write an exam or control a football. So it's those three factors that come together and then, and now it's a well kind of oiled yeah. machine with a lot of staff who are super experienced in that. I mean, the, because it, it begs the obvious question, especially right at the big, I mean, now you'll we'll get to that. Now you can, you're able to transfer players for a decent amount of money. But when you first started, and it's what noting that every kid here is on scholarship. No one pays mm. to come here. Mm. It's all free. Mm. So the question ultimately is, how do you, when you started, how were you funding all that scholarship? Because at the time you were not to transfer players, so yeah. there was no income coming in. Yeah. How, how did it all work out at the beginning? 
So I oh, was. I see back one more classroom. Yeah. You named all the classrooms. All the classrooms are named. Yeah. Oh, I see. Johnson said it there. Yeah. All named after presidents. Uh, no. We have a we have a, a variety. Have a Tom Benning? No, definitely not. No, no Tom Benning class. No, this is about Afri <laughs> African role modeling, you know. <laughs> it is. Um, uh, and so there's a staff room there. Yeah. I would have liked to check out one of the classrooms. Let's we'll go in the IT lab here. Oh, okay. That's that's okay. Um, yeah. So back to my question about um, about how you funded the scholarship yeah. at the beginning, even putting up the structure, all these classrooms, uh, education, school. Uh, feeding, you feed all of them, you, like, it's all 100% fully fun. How yeah. did you do that at the beginning? I was lucky, um, to, I, I had an idea for another business when I was in Ghana. Okay. And the, my idea was that there was a lot of um, uh, foreigners coming down to teach English in uh, schools in Ghana, okay. and they were paying for it. Right. And so they my, were paying to come. They were paying to come. I see. So my idea was, why not? If you have a passion for football like me, right. why not come down and then coach? And I knew all the Colts clubs in, in Accra. Yeah. And so I set up a company in the UK called uh, Gap Sports Abroad. Okay. And the idea was if you started doing your coaching badges and you were young and you wanted an experience, you could come down. I rented a house uh, for all of them. And then... Um, and then more, like, like a, more or less like an internship. Exactly. And then they worked with all the Colts clubs in Accra. And so... Uh, and you could charge pretty good money because the parents were often wanted to make sure that their kids were safe in Africa, all this stuff. And so that business was really successful. Okay. And that was my private business, but I used all the profits to fund yeah. the academy. So I managed to run the academy for 10 years with that business, and then I managed to build all of this from, from that. that business. That is unbelievable. That is incredible because it's one part of the... Uh, is the ICT lab? Yeah, we're going. Okay, yeah. my Angelo Castro. I love my because I'm, I'm a Navy student. So. Oh wow! Hello. Hello, guys. How are you? You're you live on Joy FM, so yeah. make sure you look nice. Live with Joy News, Joy Prime, everything Joy. <laughs> <laughs> How are you guys? How are you doing? Good. Good. Well out. Good. 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 ICT. Uh, Tom, what's happening here? Hi, nice to meet you. You're in China? Yeah, you're Mr. Benjamin as well. <laughs> yeah, very nice to meet you. Um, yeah, that's, that's my oldest son. He's teaching here. Um, right now, we're just doing video editing, I guess. Just teaching them. Basic oh. video editing or? Um, yeah, standard video editing. Like video analysis software. Oh, um, no, that's for their coaching class. Teaching them how to edit videos, how to post them, how to save them. How to create their own content. Basically. Yeah, create their own content, edit their own media. Basically. That's amazing. One of the great things that happens here is we have a robotics program. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. And um, uh, we've been uh, as far as world champion in robotics. Yeah. So we've been Ghana champion many times. You can see all of our certificates up here. And then uh, our robotics program is one of the best programs that we run at Right to Dream. Yeah. So a lot of the footballers that you see playing out there, they've been as far as the world championships in robotics as well. Wow. And you know, and for me, like one of the most impressive things, again, is the educational aspect of this. Academy. Yeah. Um, when did you, because you mentioned a very important uh, aspect of it, when did you become like so critical for you to add education, to incorporate and make it a mandatory aspect? of the academy because they have been I'm sure of course you have been in this country long enough to know that and especially around the time you came footballers really didn't care that much about school it was just about the talent but you insisted and made this a critical aspect of the academy how did you get that idea and how has that helped you in the long run I think the George Weir story that I told you is yes. the creep was the inspiration you know so it's like if you're if you're here for Ghana you know you, you would never if, if you look at a lot of football academies in in Africa you would never want your own son to be there yes. but in your example even if your son is not a good footballer you would be happy still for him to be here of course so of course. that was the that was kind of the idea was like if you how would you want it for your own son if you're not thinking that way then why are you doing it like that? And is it just because there's not much regulation so you can get away with whatever you want? And, or do you want to do the right thing? Yeah. Yeah. 
that, I, and I'm, I'm guessing that also made it easier for you to convince parents to let their kids come because there are some parents who will have and I think it's happening in the past where a lot of Ghanaians would say, you know what, I was so good at football, but my parents, my parents didn't, didn't let me play, play. football yeah. because they wanted me to go to school. This solves that problem yeah. because then parents can easily let their kids come because they mm. know that they still have school. But, you know, I mentioned before that I was uh, really close with Jones in the early days and he used to talk about the academicals and the older yeah. generation, you know. 60s. So people talk about Ghana um, in the context of uh, that like footballers are cobolos and in in like 2000s and everything you don't parents don't let them do it but really historically there's a precedent of what we do being the actual model that Ghana adopted so Jones as well was a big part in like talking about that Herbert Addo was the same um, you know highly educated coaches and so that was like part of the idea George was also part of the inspiration around that and then we just saw what it would do for our culture, you know, like if you're, if you're in an academy and you know that, okay, they like this guy and this guy, so they're focused on them for football and the rest of us are just here to support them, gradually the culture will start to deteriorate. But if you know like, okay, they think this guy is the next superstar footballer, but I'm going to Stanford University, then you worry less about somebody else and what they're getting and you focus on your own thing more. So it's a big part for the, um, you know, the culture. And uh, this is the wall you spoke about earlier, uh, the graduation wall, if I yeah. can call it that. Um, and this basically has a list of every single... So this is international, so we just hit 50 internationals. Oh, these are international? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I see you there, international yeah. honours. So these are players who have played for their national teams, yeah. not just Ghana. Yeah. And, oh wow, that list is long. So and this the is the... wall is big. Oh, that, wow. That's the professional players. Professional players yeah but all these players are playing professionally from right stream yeah so they all pick their picture like I showed you and put yeah. it up on there and you mentioned uh, is this the okay the overall best player so each year you award an overall best player yeah so we have one for the best player in the Academy mm -hmm. sorry we should have prepared better for you yeah and then one for the overall best player in Europe so at the Christmas party then we give the award and Often the player will do a video and um, you know send it back to motivate the, the next generation. Yeah. So I can see very familiar names. Uh, Mohamed Kudus was named best academy player two times. Yeah. Uh, in 2016 and also in uh, 2017. Yeah. And 2017, did he co-win it with Ibrahim Sadiq? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I see one name there, and um, I'm very impressed. Not necessarily because of just his football and. Like, you know, his footballing ability, and we'll talk about that as well. Some of the most talented uh, players you've had come to the academy. But Maxwell Wallace, he's doing yeah. a lot of work in the community. Yeah. In the community, this is an essential part of what you do here, the culture you do here. That it's not just about succeeding for yourself, but also being community champions. Yeah, and one of our early ideas was like, you should give back to write your dream, but we've changed that now because you know we found our way. We're doing okay. So we really want you to think about the things that are closest to you and your community. So Maxwell um, is like a son to me and he's one of the biggest inspirations that Right to Dream ever had because he's taken, he's used the education that he got here in a structured way to build the hijab project. He decided his passion was creating an environment for Muslim girls in Nima and now beyond to experience and develop their lives through football. And the guy's just flying with it. They, at Nike, they love him. He's one of the most popular athletes that they have, um, you know, even in a huge organization like that. So he's a fantastic guy and he's a role model. And then this is where we, this is how we recognize that. So we have the Academy Sig Significant Contribution Award. And that doesn't mean that you necessarily did something for the Academy. It might be something that you did for your, your community, community as well, so. Just an impact maker. Exactly. Um, one of the, and this is a very recognizable name for, I mean, and it, it goes to people that really follow the academy. We say you do that. Yeah. It's one of my favorite academy graduates you have, not just yeah. because he's a good footballer. I think he's a very good footballer. He's a Burkina Faso international. But he is a smart kid mm. in school. He's an Ivy League graduate. Stanford, yeah. Stanford. And he was finishing his degree, I read somewhere, while playing professionally. In the MLS, for yeah. San, San Jose. Earthquake, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is ridiculous. 
you know, to, to be able to do that, you know, and, and not just him, there's quite a number of mm. them that I have seen, especially those in the U.S. system mm -hmm. who are going professional. I think uh, Shaku Muhammad mm -hmm. is another one, the mm -hmm. Kumasi kid, mm -hmm. um, that I do. How do you teach them that life academic balance? You know, I mean, it, it all starts from here. Mm. But then when they go to the U.S., it becomes a lot easier for them. I would say it starts before here. And um, I think, you know, write your dream, you can call it like a, a, you know, a polishing school. But, you know, my belief is that the Ghanaian village is the center of excellence. And the, the development mindset that exists in the village, yeah. these ideas that it takes a village to raise a child, the communal idea that everybody can correct a kid and set them in the right direction. Yeah. Um, even, you know, the kind of pitches and the kind of coaches that we have in Ghana from two to ten for me is the best in the world because there's so many elements in terms of like how village technical development in football works so it's not like we teach these players that everybody knows to have such great technique or have such discipline or have such communal is Ghana and so the objective for our CEO here is to make sure that this place retains like the best of Ghanaian cultural essence it's not an idea from outside like we saw all the development methodology from outside with the Ajaxes in the finals. We saw it all fail here. Yeah. And so the idea here is just to make the best of the way that Ghana already sees uh, development, the way that Ghana already sees sport. And then you kind of refine and evolve that. So, um, you know, and, and then we think that's such a powerful idea that we tried to take that idea to Europe yeah. and put it in Denmark, in Egypt, in, in, in California, because a lot of like the strength and power that we have in the development methodology in Ghana, people have lost sight because we have so many day-to-day -day issues around poverty, corruption, that we're not seeing like actually underneath the surface. This is one of the most world-class development philosophies you can find in the world, and it's nothing to do with me. I didn't invent any of that stuff. It was here, and then I was lucky. I kept talking about my mentors to be a little bit inspired um, by people to get pointed in the right direction, and then I had the conviction to follow that direction which can be difficult because everything outside looks so shiny and it looks like it's working better than here so it's so easy if you're a manu to say oh maybe i should do it the manu way but a lot of mistakes trial and error but ultimately we managed to like hold on to that essence and that's why eddie is our ceo and then that's why we have um so many Ghanaian leaders here who know how to bring that to life You've got a lot of names uh, on, on this one. Mm. I want to ask you one more okay. question about the names yeah. here because um, is there one name here that you look at <sighs> and then something <laughs> just switches in your brain? Um, it doesn't necessarily mean the most successful, but perhaps one name that really just sticks out for some reason because thousands of kids have gone to this academy 25 years, a long time. Um, so this is a really hard thing to ask you to do. But if for some reason, is there one name on this wall, or maybe a couple, that yeah. just stand up for some reason? It doesn't even have to be football and reason. Hmm. It's a tough one. Eh? Yeah, you know, uh, Louisa was our first girl into the academy, um, and she tragically passed away earlier this year. Oh, wow. Um, and she was studying engineering in Milwaukee and uh, played, she was our first, first girl here, first girl to play for Ghana, and then she passed of a heart attack unexpectedly at 22 years old. Oh so, uh, you know, we're gonna rename this award after her, and, and it was a tragedy. And when we started the Girls' Academy, I didn't really believe it was gonna work. And then when I met her, I was like, okay, it's gonna work. And uh, actually, like, if I could have my time back, I may have started with girls rather than boys. And uh, so some, you know, we don't have too many girls on this list with international. Yeah. On the scholarship list, we have a lot. And then uh, on the boys' side, that's really hard. Um, <laughs> hmm. uh, I mean, I've got a, a couple of them are my friends. David is a good friend. Yeah. Um, no, one of those kids that you first sent to the UK. Yeah, him and, him, and, him and Wyrus went together to the UK. Okay. And that's where we were kind of, we were quite limited at that time on the number of options we had. Okay. And so um, we didn't have many connections with professional football clubs at the time. So some of our guys would be like, look, we know you're good. 
but go and study, show yourself, and then right. you try and find your way from there. So it's crazy, really, that like David and uh, Waris went to football college in England. Yeah. Actually, my son's just about to go there. And then Waris ended up playing Champions League World Cup. David played Champions League qualifiers. Both of them are just getting towards retirement. I've been with both of them in the last two months. They're thinking about how they can now step back in, support the Right to Dream ecosystem. So top, top, uh, top guys. And then, um, yeah, Isaac Shays is not on here because he didn't make it international, but... I was going to ask, yeah. is there like one kid that didn't necessarily make it to the highest level, but he... So I'm sure you've had a couple of those where you look at it and yeah, say, he should I'm be on very here. surprised this kid didn't... Up there. Isaac Shays. Yeah. Cool. And uh, he was one of the first four boys to move into my house. Okay. And uh, he's still very close with me, so... But it's, hard. it's a hard question, really. I don't it? think it's a... It's a hard question to ask. But if I have to pick one, then I'll say Louisa. Louisa. I mean, that's a very interesting story, man. A rather unfortunate one. Yeah, I So the, that, 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 that list... Is football. Is a list for, for professional footballers, those that have made, made it uh, as high as possible. Uh, lots of them have played at World Cups. Um, obviously, now the, the, um, the poster boy, obviously, is Mohamed Kedus, Kamal Lee, Suleiman, as well. Uh, doing really well. We'll talk about them uh, a little later. But this is one of the most impressive things as well about this academy. What is this list? So this is every kid that's graduated and gone to university abroad. Um, Straight from right to dream. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's, or, or most of the time they step into high school. We have relationships with a lot of like uh, private boarding schools in, in the US. And so at 15, the, 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 the students kind of make a decision, is it, am I going to go on football and carry on studying, okay. or am I going to go on uh, education and carry on playing football? Right. And if they, if they go on the education route, then uh, we have the relationships with these schools, you should Google them. Somewhere like Hotchkiss School, uh, you will pay like not less than $80,000 a year, I think, for your son to go there. And we have scholarships at all of these schools. Um, and we've had so many. Some of them are sitting over here now. They're back working for us. They've been over and, uh, and, and done that and then played at top universities. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's a long list now. And you can see boys and girls going to Ivy League schools on a regular basis. I mean, and, there's a, and you mentioned <laughs> there are some very, very top schools here, including Ivy League schools. I see uh, Stanford University. Um, we're saying Buda, we just mentioned it uh, as well. Villanova is a top sports university as well. Yeah. Uh, they have a very good football team. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Duke University. Um, that's that's Chaco. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so and Duke is um, obviously one of the best basketball schools yeah. in, in the US as yeah. well. And it was 10 minutes away from the university that I went to in North Carolina. Uh, Georgetown. Uh, yeah. So these are so these are not just these are not just schools where the kids just go because they have to go to school. You have to be really good to get here. Yeah, yeah it's tough. I couldn't have got into any of this. <laughs> That's the point, right? Um, and and so then that connects to this list here of a role best student. Yeah, yeah. As well, because surely to be getting into these schools, you have to be some of the people on this wall. Yeah. In terms of academics, industry, corporate issues, what, uh, innovation, what are some of these kids, what have they gone on to do? And I see Rajiv Wad is there, so he wasn't just a good footballer, he was also a really good student. Emmanuel Bating as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Emmanuel Bating, he, he um, could have gone to Harvard, um, wow. but he went into the, he had an offer from Harvard, but he went into the MLS. Uh, Josh Yarrow as well, Josh Yarrow has a degree in international diplomacy from Georgetown. Um, so, and now they're like Mohamed Zaki who's now got a great corporate job in, uh, in US. So a lot of them are starting to, some of them still play after university, yes. which we, we think is great, you know, get your degree, play for a few years, fulfill your passion, and then take the learnings from academics and pro football into the next part of your career. So, and then, and then some of them, we can go and meet some of our guys. Like they then, sure. um, they then uh, uh, come back and work for Right to Dream having gone to top schools and all that kind of stuff some of them yeah and some are summer stuff
Guys, we're putting you on the Hi. on the Hi. spotlight now. I'm from, uh, I'm from Joy Sports. Uh, Theo. Nice uh, Theo. You. Very yeah. nice to meet you. Thank you. Yeah, very nice to meet you. How are you guys? Yeah. Yeah, Tommy's giving me a tour. Yeah. We're uh, talking about the student athlete yeah. model. Yeah, yeah, we, we wanted to come and say hello. So Theo is involved with our international academy. Okay. So that's our best players from 16 to 18. Okay. They, how, how much of the year do you spend abroad? Maybe 60 percent. of the year. Yeah. Oh, wow. In which countries? Uh, Denmark, uh, Spain, and then in, in Africa, Egypt as well. So, that's kind of so he, he coordinates like pastoral and some of the education components for our best players 16 to 18. We don't like them to play too much in uh, Ghana 16 to 18. We want better level of competition. So you can get some good matches here, but then a lot of matches abroad. So Kusi is goalkeeper's coach, but he's more than that within the IA. And then Theo uh, is running that. Theo went to Marquette University in, uh, sorry, Villanova. Villanova. So you went to Marquette. Yeah, okay. went to <coughs> rivals. The rivals, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, then, uh, and then came back. Kusi, any university? <laughs> <laughs> and then C is the big boss here. And, and that's, the, I, I, that's the next phase of a conversation I wanted to talk about, the, the graduation. You mentioned it earlier when you talked about um, adding value to the players. Yes, and I think Thanks. Uh, ultimately um, that's the reason you went on and acquired FC Lorsham because you realized that there was a point in the players development where there were maybe a little bit stark is that, is that what it is? I think the you know the story of transition for African potentials and talents into Europe is um, is a complicated one you know like uh, you know at least as well as I do the kind of challenges that young African players face when they step into Europe and um, and we kept on seeing that so a lot of the names that you see on the board I don't think they fulfilled their potential um, and a lot of that was to do with the early transition to Europe to get comfortable on the pitch off the pitch show your best and then be ready to really step into a club where uh, the money and uh, you know the money and everything and the attention is big so we wanted to create that stepping stone where because we felt so many kids were like underachieving we wanted to create that stepping stone where we could kind of control the pathway so we bought the club and then but then as I mentioned to you we also felt like some of the deeper development methodology from Ghana was relevant almost as an export idea exactly. so we wanted to export like the Ghanaian cultural philosophy into other parts of the world but at the same time we wanted to make sure that our best players like could really get the right setting so that meant we own our own club so that we can obviously appoint the people that we trust yeah. but then that we could also bring in um, experts like Didi Dramani, Michael Essien, Otto Addo, yeah. like Kingston, Derek Boating, uh, C who we just met he was there for like four or five years oh, wow. so we could put our experts into the environment to make sure that our boys had the best and girls now because yeah. Princess Marfa went there and made a big success to make sure that all of those transitions could be dealt with in the right way and you know you know uh, speaking broadly then you know issues of racism are still very very prevalent in European football and so if you're relying on like each player finding his own club probably you can say like 40% of your kids are going to end up in a bad first club and then how you recover to get out of that club into another club is the death of a lot of great talents so we haven't again we, we haven't got it perfect and we've also had some guys coming to our club where it didn't work out right uh, or as we wanted but generally like we've managed to create an environment where our kids feel comfortable they have some of their teammates around they have some seniors like Michael around and then like as we've seen then they can transition on the pitch quicker and then they're much more able to go to Ajax or uh, Leon or or Ren or wherever and 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 like cope with that transition because ultimately I mean what is so relevant is that ultimately Mohammed Kudus or Kamadi and Suleiman uh, 
they work for something in the region in excess of 20 million euros in transfer fees after maybe two years or three years at FC Northland. I, I think we can all agree that if they spend those two years or three years extra here at Right Dream, there's no chance they go for that much. Yeah, and then, um, you know, then we're starting to get into like big kind of structural issues that are beyond our control. But, um, you know, for us, like why, I don't know what the transfer for Hendrik was out of Brazil, but why Hendrik can leave Brazil for that kind of money. Exactly. Um, you know, I love FCN and it's been a great part of the journey. But if we could have, if, if global football respected the African ecosystem in the right way, maybe we wouldn't have needed to do it. Exactly. You know, so it was really like a, out of necessity. And so we thought for a while, should we build our own like super club in Ghana? And we tried it a little bit, but I didn't really believe with the number of factors that are beyond our control and against African football more broadly. And then there's also a lot of internal factors where we're also like cannibalizing ourselves as a, as a, as a football uh, community in Africa. Like all of those factors are beyond our control. So we said, okay, let's make sure that we can deliver success for our kids. And so that was the, that was the strategy. And then, you know, then it led to people being inspired and the Mansour investment and now a right to dream in Egypt, right to dream in US. So that was the next step because we proved concept. But yeah, it's, it's, um, uh, it's more to do with like uh, global forces that depress African market values, which is common in all industries, not just football. It is. And so we had to break out against that. And that's why, for example, because I remember the time when the, it became, uh, I think when the news broke that um, uh, you had acquired SE North. I know that, for example, building an academy here in Ghana, it, it, it's something very impressive. But at the same time, acquiring a football club in Europe, that is a, a whole other animal. Mm. Not just in terms of what is involved, but also even getting resources for it. How did you, because Right to Dream, it runs as a non-profit, right? So how did you get money to buy FC Lawson? Like, and like you said, it was a necessity project. So how did you find the money? I borrowed 10 million pounds from a friend in London. Wow, and, uh, you it know was... a friend that has 10 million pounds? <laughs> luckily, <laughs> luckily, <laughs> <laughs> luckily I do. And uh, it, was, um, it was a huge risk. And, um, and so, but we just, we just decided that like, otherwise we're just gonna stay in the status quo. We think our kids have so much potential. Yeah. Like, you know, that Were for me- Were you actively looking for a club or it Yeah, no, we made it a strategic decision. Okay. We were so frustrated seeing like some of the challenges that we couldn't overcome. And one day I was in a, a board meeting and then one of the board members, name is Kofi Anku, he said, but Tom, what's the solution? I said, the only solution is to buy our own club in Europe. And I didn't really think Maybe about it. Possible. He was like, okay, go and do it. So then it was like, okay, why not? And then, um, and then I knew a guy who'd always said, look, if you ever want to make a like, real play or anything, just call me. His name is Bob Finch. And, um, and so I did. And uh, I said, look, I've got this idea. Me and, uh, and a guy, Joe Mulberry, we've done a lot of analysis of all the markets. We think Denmark is unique for a number of reasons and no one's really like, thought about it before. And so we want to we wanna, like, take this big step. And, we went and made a pitch to him, and, I, and we thought like it would take some months. We went and sat in the pub in Wimbledon after the pitch, and he called 30 minutes later. He said, I'll give you all the money. Wow. Yeah, so, but you know, we had to pay the money back, so, yeah, it's, so it's not like a, a, a charity thing. So then, then we knew, okay, we had the, the, the money to, um, to go and like really look in the market, and then we looked at two or three specific clubs, and we ended on FCN. And then we took that huge, it was a huge risk. And, um, you know, it, it almost didn't work out. And if it hadn't worked out, then the whole thing would have been bankrupted, so. And you've had, to, to be, and to be fair, you've had probably one of the best decisions, if not the best decision that you've ever made, because you look at the talent that has come out of FC Northland in the last few years alone. Um, and you had been doing it right to dream for maybe 20 odd years without, such a big sale and then you go to FC Northland, um, you were in debt, like you said, you had to borrow money, take a big risk and then within such a short period of time, it all just started to pay off with all these big transfers that are coming in. 
granted those players are talented, but surely, right, FC Notion added real value to a lot of those players like Kudus or Kamaldi and Kilimanjaro. What was the strategy when you first acquired the club? Every year, how many kids did you send there, or is it just the very best? Or how did you select the kids that ended up at FCM? Um, well, one thing I would say to start with is that, like, the Ghanaian Ivorian players have been a big part of the success, but also by um, the club that we bought, the academy that it had, but also the methodology that we brought in from Ghana. Like, you can see players, play, Danish players, playing in the Premier League who trained here in Ghana you know, and so we realize a lot of um, transfer fees on the Danish side as well so the club was um, sustainable it was like balanced a lot, you know you can look at a lot of projects with African investment that went into Europe if you look at Beveren uh, that uh, was from ASEC and then they bought a team in Belgium and they played with like 11 Ivorians on the team and then it was dependent on one source so our idea was not to fall into that trap. And so the, the success of FCN has come from um, driving and investing in local talent as much as it has uh, here. But then in terms of, um, in terms of the, which players go, then this program we run 16 to 18, we call it the International Academy. Um, that's where we travel the world. We play against the best all the time. And then it's, it's normal football. It's obvious, like, okay, these are the best guys, and, and then some uh, go to other clubs, and then some come to, to FCN. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned one name that really sticks out, Simon Adingra. Uh, Simon, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, AFCON winner. Is he your first AFCON winner? Yeah, because you guys never <laughs> managed to get, <laughs> it, get it done. So <laughs> if you can win it, then we'll have a lot. But uh, Yeah, if Ghana won the AFCON today, right now, I think you probably would have if I'm not mistaken, maybe at least three Afcon winners. In there are six in the squad, in this squad. In this, this last squad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the one that played the uh, Mali and the... Uh, yeah. That's a lot. Uh, there was one point where it looked at like half of the team was made up of right to dream graduates. I think this was stuck around the 2019 Afcon. I'm so Thomas happy for... Uh, Japan, uh, yeah, yeah. And all yeah, yeah. of these players were, were part of the national team. Um, that's impressive. The next thing I wanted to talk about the feature of the club. You mentioned the big investment that came in from the Marcel Group um, around 2021, I believe. How did you arrive at that decision to begin with that, you know what, maybe it's time for me to open up because you had done this all by yourself for a really long time. Um, and then you got to your point, you were like, you know, let's open it up. Yeah. Well, a couple of main things. One was that I saw the potential for it to create opportunities for um, you know for kids who may not get the access without us so in Egypt that's proved to be true like we have fantastic players in the academy there um, and if they hadn't come to write your dream then their pathway to fulfilling their talent may not have been there um, same in California it's amazing because we're right on the border there so you have Tijuana and then you have they call them border babies all these uh, Mexican kids that are like stuck on the border and they have talent but they don't have a pathway so one thing was obviously we didn't have anywhere near the financial muscle to go and build new academies um, you know the Mansours have invested well over half a billion dollars in 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 right to dream group since they came in um, so that was part of it and then the other part of it was like you know with the way that I structured the club every year it was like stress because you had to make the transfers. And so every year you'd be looking and saying, okay, if we don't make a transfer, what would the implications be in Ghana? If we don't make a transfer for two years, then the implications are even bigger. So after like 21 years of carrying that, I was like, I want to be on a different level where we can think strategically about things. And so the Mansours, like in terms of their ambition and the amount of investment and patience and stability that they have as the perfect, perfect partner. and you know, uh, everybody will die one day. So I need to make sure that this is in the best hands rather than, you can see some African football projects where when the founder passes, then the project falls apart. Falls apart. And, uh, and I didn't want to be in that situation. So in some ways it's difficult because you love to make the decisions and, and be on top. But, uh, you know, for the long term of the project, then uh, it made sense mainly to create more opportunity, but also to make sure that it was stable and then also like for 25 years 
I've been hustling like 24-7, 365. You know what it takes to make something like this happen. And so that, that also, um, I don't want to go to an early grave because you push too hard for too long. So that was a big part of my, my thing. And my wife and my youngest son, they're like, you're never, never around. So let's try and get a bit of balance. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's impressive to hear. Because, um, you know, and, and you hit a nail on the head. Sometimes when you build something, you can get too attached. And, um, you know, that in the end could be the killer. What, what, you know, it's like food, right? The food <laughs> that we eat is what helps us grow, but it's the same food that kills us. Yeah, yeah. You know? so, um, what, so, FC Nochelan is um, separate from Right to Dream in terms of um, the operations. Right, so you're staying with FC Nochelan as chairman. You're just stepping down as CEO of the Right to Dream Group. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah. So you continue to run FC Nochelan as a football club? N not, not in the same way because okay. uh, we have a group CEO yeah. who's replaced me, and then the CEO of FC Nochelan reports to the group CEO. Okay. Um, and then as chairman, I still obviously have some influence, but it's not, um, it's not like that hands-on. It's not like how uh, Florentino Perez is running Real Madrid is. Right president where he's doing everything that's what I was doing before okay. uh, but now we've built like a corporate global structure that means it's all managed so I wouldn't say it's like ceremonial but it's like um, be around for the big things now we're changing head coach so have a little bit of influence on that but not not do it myself okay. uh, let's talk about uh, the future then uh, with uh, the Montreal group coming in and within such a short period of time you mentioned they invest in five half a billion dollars They've already got the Egypt Academy up and running, and they're building a, a new football club in the MLS. They took, they, they're joining the MLS in 25, I believe, mm -hmm. San Diego Football mm -hmm. Club. Mm -hmm. And you're building a super academy uh, in San Diego to support. Here we are again, another beautiful day. We are here at the Nyahu Medical Center in airport. And it's always a good time. Any time is a good time to talk about prostate issues. When was the last time you ever checked on your prostate? 